Oh, you turned it on. So we were talking about Yang Mills theory, and um, the basic idea is that we have a vector of fields, matter fields, like this, and we want the action density to be variant. under a transformation like this, where this is an n by n matrix. It depends upon the space-time point. And this is said to be a local symmetry, so we want the Lagrange density L prime of x to equal L of x. Um, of course, what's really needed is for the action to be invariant and um, so one could have L prime be L plus a total derivative, but in fact, um, in the yang mills case, you don't need to include a total derivative. Um, these yang mills equations are easiest in terms of matrix notation, but if we do put in indices, then this is what it looks like, and we're summing here j equal 1 to n, and usually I'm going to just assume that if you have two indices repeated that we're summing over. Okay, so we saw... So the gijs are some representation of the group element on this space that the size live in? Right. The, the, the Ooh, shit. You want to make shit? Uh, <laughs> All right, you get one. Thank you. Reese's no. peanut butter cup. These are these are pretty good, actually. Um, okay, so we have some vector, an n-dimensional vector, and we have some matrix, and um, typically it's. Uh, I mean, it could be any set of matrices, but um, but in every case that uh, I've ever seen, these matrices belong to some group, and the group is usually a unitary group, usually SU2 or SU3, more generally SUN or ON or SON. Now the problem here comes from the derivatives because you have something, the, the free action for a Fermi field is that, and uh, there's no problem with M, the other problem with M, but this isn't the problem with M. Um, but there are problems with the derivative because the derivative will act on G. And uh, so if this is our Lagrangian, that's L, then L prime will be psi bar I gamma mu d mu of G psi. Um, let me just set M equal to zero here. So let's just look at the important part. So we have this uh, derivative is acting on both G and psi. Does the G appear with sidebar as well? Brilliant. Absolutely. In fact, um, that's why if the group is unitary, 
if the matrices are unitary and independent of, of x, then uh, the G dagger cancels the G and just becomes the identity. Um, you're certainly entitled to another. Okay, so so this so this is the this is the this is the problem, and so what we want to do is we want to have. Let me just write it more simply as psi dagger d mu psi. We want to turn this into something different, psi dagger d mu psi, so that. Uh, so that this is invariant, and this will be invariant. You can have another word, psi dagger d mu psi. This is going to be like psi dagger g dagger d, d prime mu psi prime. And, well, the psi prime is a g psi, and so if you want, is this will be equal to psi dagger d mu psi if g dagger d mu prime g is equal to d mu and um, this will be true if d mu prime g is equal to g d mu and, and so that's the basic uh, rule that we want Effectively, d mu psi, what we really want is d mu psi prime to be g d mu psi. That's what we want. We want the derivative to transform simply the same. We want the derivative to transform the same way the field transforms. And we, have we assumed here the group is unitary? We are for now, yeah, yeah. And um, that, that's almost always. That's, in the standard literature, that's always the case. I've written some papers where it isn't, but um, it's, uh, it's in the standard literature, it's always the case. Okay, so um, if this is the case, then uh, what we have then is multiplying by G adjoint, we have the d prime mu is equal to g of x d mu d, uh, d mu g inverse of x multiplying both sides of this equation by g inverse and the way we achieve this is we say that d mu is a derivative plus something else and um, then this d mu prime is going to be d mu plus a mu prime, and we want this to be g, whoops, g d mu plus uh, a mu times g inverse, and so this is equal to d mu plus g a mu g inverse plus g d mu g inverse. So subtracting the d mu from both sides, we get that a mu prime should be a mu plus, whoops, must not go on auto plan. G A mu G inverse plus G D mu G inverse. And in fact, another way of writing this is, is G D mu G inverse. Although that isn't terribly useful. So in, in, the, in the case of U1, G of x equals a to the i theta of x and uh, a mu prime is just equal to a mu minus i d mu theta. 
Um, I should mention that I'm using a notation that makes the equations clean, namely that the covariant derivative is a derivative plus something else, a mu. In the standard literature of this, a mu is equal to minus i g a mu. Um, and so there's a, there's a factor of i and a coupling constant um, that I'm absorbing into a to make the equations uh, simple. Um, so, uh, in the case of SU2, g of x is e to the i theta of x dot sigma over 2. And um, so g inverse is e to the minus i theta dot sigma over 2. And for the infinitesimal case, g inverse is e to the minus i epsilon dot sigma over 2, which is 1 minus i epsilon dot sigma over 2. And so um, in this case, for SU2, the infinitesimal gauge transformation is 1 plus i epsilon dot sigma over 2 a mu 1 minus i epsilon dot sigma over 2 and then um, minus i, uh, uh, well, let's see, I might as well work it out in two terms. This, well, you see that this, the derivative of d mu of g inverse is just minus i sigma over 2 dot d mu epsilon. So this is already of order epsilon. So it's not to screw up again. I'll just say that this is equal to minus i sigma over 2 dot d mu epsilon. Okay. So this is the expression. And if we um, multiply it out, a mu prime is equal to a mu plus i um, epsilon a sigma a over 2 a mu minus i sigma a over 2 d mu epsilon. Yep. Okay. So in terms of indices, it's that. We now let a mu be sigma a over 2 a mu a or in this case b, and then what we have is uh, a prime mu a sigma a over 2 is a a mu sigma a over 2 plus i epsilon a sigma a over 2 sigma b over 2 a b mu uh, minus i sigma a over 2 d mu epsilon a. And now, of course, the, in any yeah, no, in any um, Lie algebra for compact group, the commutator of the generators is i times the structure constants uh, times the, uh, so it's a sum of the generators with i, fabc, the AB, fabc is totally anti-symmetric. And in this particular case, sigma a over 2, sigma b over 2 is i epsilon a, b, c, sigma c over 2. So for the choice of u1, is it true that the a mu is just the, is that just the photon field? Yeah, yeah or some other field. I mean, you could have other gauge fields that are, so is this the reason they're called gauge fields? Because we demanded that we had this gauge freedom, which forced us to add this field? Yes. Ah. And in fact, what you, can, what you can see is that the action for the fermion changes from this to psi bar 
I gamma mu, let me make a square bracket here, p mu plus a mu minus m psi, and so you have new vertices and interactions, psi a psi, and they're forced by the, the requirement that you have symmetry that is Should local, that be a big D? Which or is a to say depends upon X. G depends upon X. Right. Should that be a big D or a... No! Yeah. So just by demanding a gauge symmetry, we get these gauge fields right. that carry the force in a sense. Right. And the same thing happens well. in... In fact, all of the interactions in that are known in well, all of them, I should say most of the interactions. There are other terms in the in the Lagrangian that are just put in for giggles. Um, uh, but uh, most of the interactions are um, are there to make the that action density symmetric. And um, in the case of general relativity, uh, what's put in to make the uh, action symmetric is uh, that you put in a metric field that varies with space with space time, and um, you put it in in such a way that um, uh, that the action's invariant, and uh, that means you have gravitational. Effect. Okay. So um, now we have. So let's see. We have this uh, equation here. This term uh, simplifies because of this, and what we get is a prime a mu. I guess I'm multiplying the truth by a factor of six, a factor of two. Now you have I epsilon A, but then you have I from the commutator epsilon A, B, C, sigma C, uh, A, B mu minus I sigma A, D mu epsilon A. And um, it, one can trace this out, but I think it's, it's simpler just to change the indices uh, here slightly, um, interchange A with C. And if you interchange A with C, this is a C, this is a C, that's an A and that's an A. Now these sigmas are linearly independent, and so you can, you can just, um, one thing is you multiply by sigma A, or sigma C, say, take the trace, or sigma D, take the trace, and you get delta AD everywhere. Um, or more simply, you say the sigma A's are independent, and so you get A prime A mu is A mu A plus I, well, minus, actually, two minus, minus epsilon C, epsilon C D A, a, B, U, minus I, B, U, epsilon, A. Okay, so that's what the, that's how the gauge field transforms under an infinitesimal gauge transformation for SU2. Uh, a somewhat more cosmetic way of writing it is constants are zero and you just have a mu a is minus i d mu epsilon a. Um, now since we've got d mu prime uh, is d is g d mu g inverse, you've got all sorts of invariants, namely psi bar, gamma mu, 
15 meters side, this is invariant, but also trace of d mu d nu d mu d nu. That's invariant. Of course, you could say, well, trace of d mu is invariant under the gauge transformation. Well, it is, but it's not Lorentz invariant. And uh, in fact, it's effectively zero because for for um, unitary groups, well, for S U N and S O N groups of whose determinants are zero, uh, the generators are traceless, and so this would be zero. So I guess it is Lorentz invariant. <laughs> But um, if it weren't zero, then it wouldn't be Lorentz invariant. Also, you can say, well, trace of d mu d nu, this um, is invariant. And the reason is that it transforms as g g inverse, but then the, this is the same thing as trace d mu d nu. And you bring the g to the other side because the trace of a b is the trace of b a. And so this is invariant, but it's not Lorentz invariant. So when you have but when you have four factors here, you have something that's Lorentz invariant and gauge invariant. And um, okay. And the reason, of course, that this is invariant is that the G just trans the D transforms with GG inverse. The GG inverse in between cancel. And they cancel in here, and you all, all you get is a G there and a G inverse there, and so the trace is uh, zero. That's Lorentz invariant because all the indices are something? Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. <coughs> We're in a special relativity line. But you can. All right, so um, what is uh, D mu D nu? Well, this is D mu plus a nu, d nu plus a nu, and this is d nu a nu minus d nu a nu plus commutator of a nu with a nu. And um, in fact, what we'll do is we'll call this f nu nu. And in the case of SU2, then F mu nu is then, well, it's these terms, which is D nu A nu A sigma A over 2 minus D nu A A sigma A over 2 nu. Um, but then the next term is A nu A sigma A over 2 a nu b sigma b over 2, and then sigma, sigma a, sigma b, the i epsilon, a, b, c. Anyway, what, what you wind up with then is sigma a over 2 times d nu, a nu a minus d nu, a nu a, and then this term is i epsilon a, b, c, Sigma C over 2, A mu A, A mu B. And now, um, if we interchange A and C again, we get a C here, a C there. These become A's. Now, the next thing is we can move A to the front, and then we have ACB, and then we can interchange, we can change B and C. So altogether this thing is epsilon ABC, sigma A over 2, AB mu, A mu C. And so, D mu D nu, which is F D nu, is then sigma A over 2 times.
times a um, times d mu a mu a minus d mu a mu a plus i epsilon a b c a d mu a mu c. So that's and and this has been rebaptized as f a. So this is the Yang Mills field strength. It's likely this is the if there were just one value for A, this would be F mu nu as in E and M, and there wouldn't be any terms here because this would be zero. And so this is the generalization of the uh, of F mu nu from electrodynamics to more general case. Now we can um, recall that the, 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 these generate, let's see, I should maybe, while we're at it here, I can say in the more general case, F A mu nu would be D mu A nu A minus D mu A mu A plus I F A B C A B A C mu nu, where F A B C of the structure constant so T A T B is I F A B C T C. Given those structure constants, one can define the matrices in the adroid representation as T A B C is minus I F A B C. So the structure constants allow you to define. Uh, a new set of matrices that are the generators in the adjoint representation. There it is in the group in the adjoint representation. Remind me what the adjoint representation is? It's this. Okay, so it's defined by yeah, setting that absolutely. matrix element equal to this structure constant. Right, in the case of SU2, You want to put candy in the S? Actually, you've asked so many questions, I'm afraid the others are going to stop. But, uh, it's okay, I'm generous. Keep on asking, but yeah, that's right. Like throw them at her. So. Okay, in the case of um, SU2, of course, the, the primary generators are just the Pauli matrices divided by 2. These guys are three by three matrices that. Um, so just ones and minus ones? Uh, well, yeah, but, um, well, or I's, depending on the basis, you know. But they're the matrices, the basic matrices that are involved in the rotations. In fact, they're essentially epsilon ABC, because of course they must be, because they're defined by TABC, in the case of SP2 is minus I. Epsilon A and C. All right, so that's what I've got here. All right, well, we can go back to this infinitesimal transformation in the general case. Well, let's see, I'm sort of. Let me. What we had was, um, for an infinitesimal transformation, again, to the case of SU2, it's minus epsilon ABC, EB, ACU, minus I, D mu, epsilon A, and you can rewrite that as A mu A minus I, T A, B C, epsilon B, A C mu, minus I, D mu, epsilon A, even write it in a somewhat, I don't know if these, these forms are actually all that useful, but minus i epsilon thought of as a vector, the matrix TA, A mu thought of as a vector, and then minus i T mu epsilon. Now, let, let me just remind you that the trace of these generators and the defining representation are some constant A delta AB. 
in the case of SU2, this is the trace of sigma A over 2, sigma B over 2, and that sigma A, sigma B, I'll just remind you, is delta AB plus I epsilon ABC sigma C. The sigma C is traceless, so this is a quarter trace of delta AB, which is a half. So K is a half. So K is a half for SU2, at least for SU2 if you take the TAs to be sigma A over 2. You could, if you rescale them to something else, then you get a different number. So let's see, rather than go through, all, go, go through all this algebra which I have in my notes here, or do you want to see it? you want to see the infinitesimal transformation derived in the general case, or shall I just give you the bottom line? Yeah. All right. Bottom line. I'm close to a different bottom line. Actually, if you were to change B and C, it becomes somewhat more symmetric. So it looks a little better. Okay, well, let's look at the commutator of D nu with D nu in the general case. This is the commutator of D nu plus. T A A A U D nu plus T B A B nu. And now this uh, is um, T A times D nu A nu A minus D nu A nu A. And then plus I F A B C T C. A, A, U, A, B, Nu, and we can rewrite that as D, U, D, Nu is T, A, F, A, U, Nu, where F, A, U, Nu is D, U, A, A, Nu minus D, Nu, A, U, A, and then plus I, F A B C A B U A C U. Okay, so this is for an arbitrary compact T. Um, just a question. So how are the small lifts related to the capital T and the on the previous part? 
The Fs, the little Fs, are always the structure constants. Now they related to the Ds. That's right there. So the little Fs are defined by this equation. Yeah. Okay. So for SU2, the, the Ts are sigma A over 2, and F is just, FABC is just epsilon ABC. For SU3, the TAs are normally taken to be the lambda, the 3 by 3 Galois matrices divided by What are two. those capital Ts? Those are, those are, those are the adjoint representation. Yeah. And the adjoint representation is always defined by this equation. TA, B, the BC matrix element, is minus I FABC. And the structure constants are independent of representation. They are uh, a property of the gauge group. And you can see, in a sense, why they're independent of, of representation, because you, you take some representation called the defining representation, you form this commutator, that tells you what the Fs are. And um, then given these Ts, which you picked as your defining generators, you take the trace of the product and that gives you a K. You're stuck with this K once you pick the Ts. Okay, so one this so I said one term in the action density that was not zero and Lorentz and gauge invariant was this trace of the commutator of covariant derivatives taken quadratically and raising and lowering the indices, and then what this is, of course, is, tra is, is by this relation, it's the trace of TA, F, mu nu A, TB, F, mu nu B. Now, for compact groups, you raise and lower the group indices cosmetically. You just you don't care where they are. It's just you sort of move them out of the way so you don't have them, you, know, you don't have too many in indices up here. If you're dealing with non-compact groups, then in fact there is a difference between upper and lower. But um, I'm not, we're not dealing with them now, and they're, most people don't deal with them at all. So this is um, the trace of TATB times FA. F B U nu U nu. This is K delta A B, and so altogether this is K F mu nu A F mu uh, nu A summed over A mu and nu. Now, as I said, I've been um, using what. Well, what I think of as a clean notation, du plus a mu. And um, in fact, I think mathematicians generally would like a notation, for this to the normal physics notation, just as the mathematicians would normally write the um, arbitrary uh, group element as um, e to the theta a they call it theta A T A, but the, they choose these matrices T A to be anti-emission. Um, instead, what we do is we say it's E to the I theta A T A, and then we make the T A's emission. So we put an I in and we take an I out. Um, anyway, an I for an I. Okay, so. This mathematical A A mu turns out in physics land to be minus I G A A mu. And what I found kind of remarkable is that 
this change is um, consistent with Peskin, Schroeder, Shrednicki, and Weinberg. They all have the same uh, definition of the covariant derivative. And so in particular, d mu physical is d mu minus i g t a a a mu. So in other words, um, what I've written up, up, up to this point was, was the mathematical one, and now that means we've got this as the, the, uh, the other one. And so where does the uh, generator come from? It's the same generator. We always have the same generator. But if I just take this. But it, it's always in physics land, it's always a cost of If I take this mathematical one and just substitute it into the top there, there's no. Uh... So, what are we trying to do? Oh, the, the G's are this is mm -hmm. d mu right. plus a mu mathematic. So where is the generator coming from in the mathematical a mu? Oh, but I mean, there's, there's no T A in that expression at that point. That's because I have a particular A. If you want, I can okay. multiply by T A. which you can use to nourish, to nourish your... In fact, you've asked so many questions, you can just pass these around. Okay, so let's keep track then of what happens to the mathematical uh, field strain. I'm covering up an awful lot of blackboards today. So the mathematical FA is then minus I G times D mu A nu A minus D mu A nu A. And then what did we have over here? We had an I F A B C and then two of these. So we're going to get a g squared and a minus i. And so this is minus i g squared f a b c a u a u b c. And now we can factor out a minus i g, and we have um, d mu a nu a minus d nu a nu a plus g f a b c a b a c a nu. So this is the, the, the in, phys, in most physics notation, this is the... Uh, I have just a question. Yeah. Uh, these these uh, small a's and b's and c's, if I want to raise and lower them, how do I... Oh, wait, them? You, you just move them any way you want. Okay. So it's compact it's groups has no effect. The metric is the identity of the matrix. You look at it, it's a recent product. So why were we interested in the multiplication of some commentators? Other than that, yeah, they're invariant under gauge transform. Right, they're, they're, they're Lorentz invariant and gauge invariant, and they're the simplest thing involving the A's that is. Okay. So it's the generalization of E squared minus B squared mm -hmm. of electrodynamics. And in uh, the non abelian gauge context, it's still E squared minus B squared. It's just that it's the, it's the uh, non-abelian electric field and the non-abelian magnetic field. Just to be totally sure, <clears throat> this A mu that's up top, without any other index on it, is a matrix. That's equal to the this sum of A mu A with T A. Yes. Okay. Always. Got it. OK, 
Okay, let's see. Um, I feel as though I owe somebody a chocolate. I owe you one. I owe you another, but you don't want one. Okay, so let's look at the action now for the Ann Mills theory. Um, we know what it is. It's going to be psi bar i, and instead of little d slash, it's going to be capital D slash minus m. And so the the um, action is going to be the integral of Lagrange density d of x, where l is minus a quarter f a mu nu f mu nu a plus psi bar i d slash minus m psi. So it's in this notation, uh, it's pretty simple to write down. Um, and let me remind you what this d mu is. In this case, you can call it d mu alpha beta if you want. Then it's d mu delta alpha beta minus i g a, a mu T A alpha beta. So I'm okay. So this is a in other words, it's the derivative times the identity matrix minus I G, and then these are the generators. And um, in the notes I write down what the generators are for the SU3, they're a half times the lambda times the Galmandra matrices, just as for SU2, they're a half times the Pauli matrices. And if you want to see what they are, you can just Google Galmand matrices wiki, and um, you get a nice, you get a standard representation. Okay, now, I think I'll make as a homework problem for Monday, Deriving the classical field equations, in other words, if you say that the action is stationary, what do you get as a field equation? Well, you get, and let me, let me just say to you that, admit to you that this sort of makes sense for scalar fields and vector fields. For fermions, this stationarity action is a little bit puzzling. And so I'll allow you to just say, just take the partial with respect to psi bar and you get this equal to zero. So, uh, so uh, you don't need to go through some very elaborate analysis here. Um, so what you get, in fact then, let me make the homework problem derive the equation of motion for this field. Uh, so the first equation of motion is just I d slash psi minus n, I d slash minus n psi equals zero. The other equation, and this is a homework problem, the answer is d mu f a mu nu plus g structure constants f a b c a b mu f c mu nu equals minus g J A nu. So this looks like Maxwell's equations, but in Maxwell's equations, the structure constants vanish. There's only one value of A, and then you have minus the divergence of F mu nu is J nu with a plus or minus E there. And this J A nu is psi bar gamma nu T A psi. And now, the action density, well, it's just this action L minus L0, where L0 is, um, is, is the uh, Lagrange density with G equal to 0. 
and um, I'm, see, I'm trying to say board space, but I'm out of luck. So L then is equal to the quadratic Lagrangian, the G equals zero Lagrangian plus, and then it's going to be a G A A mu. And then, in fact, this I could write as just J A nu, but or J A mu actually, upper mu. But I'll might as well write it as gamma mu uh, T A psi. So we sum over the mu's and the a's. That's the easy part. But you see, this gives you your squaring a, so you've got this thing squared. This squared gives you L, the gauge part of L0. Then you've got a cross term of derivatives times this, and then you've got this squared. All right. So the terms are minus g f a b c and um, I, that's kappa lambda a. I mean, I didn't have to do kappa lambda, but I copied this from Pessman Schroeder, so I thought I'd better not change you over the indices or I might screw up. Uh, minus a quarter g squared f e a b F E C D A kappa A lambda A B A kappa A lambda C D. All right, so this is the what's L zero in here? It's L with G equal to zero. And um, that actually is the next equation here. So L0 is minus a quarter d mu a nu a minus d nu a mu a times the same thing with the indices. That's that part, and then the Fermi part of it is psi bar i d slash minus m psi. That's L2. And so what we have is we have three new vertices. One coming from psi bar psi a, and then we have a triple vertex, three gauge fields, a a derivative of a, and then we have four gauge fields. Where did, where did all these other terms come from? How did we get all these additional terms besides L0? I mean, because isn't L0 this L that was right there? It's the same L. What did we do to get, we squared we got something. We here. So we squared this. Well, maybe I should have done that, damn it. When you square this, you get this squared which is that, okay? Got it. Then, then you get a cross term, these derivatives times this. Mm -hmm. And then, well, you've got, you know, the mu nu here and the mu nu going there. It's actually a little bit complicated because this mu nu is anti-symmetric. This mu nu looks as though it's kind of symmetric, but it sort of isn't because of the BC, the, B, the BC here, and then that comes down here, so it's effectively anti-symmetric also. So you wind up, and the dust settles with this as the cross term. And then you just square this, and squaring that, you keep one of the index, one of the indices constant. In this case, Peston Schroeder chose E, instead of choosing A, which would have made sense, they choose E. And, um, but, that's, that's what you get. So we have new, three kinds of new vertices. And, um, um, 
So Jackson Pollock, right from this way, well, as I said, Eskin Schroeder is one of the Jackson Pollock theoretical physics. So this, this uh, vertex comes out to be I, G, gamma mu, T, A. And this is something that you deal that, that you had to deal with, with the, in, in one of the homework problems where there were sigma A's. Then you have one with three, three uh, gauge bosons. And in QCD, these would be three gluons. And if this were A mu with, with K going this way, Q going this way, C rho, T going this way, D nu, then this, this one would be G, FADC, times eta mu nu, k minus, whoops, that's k minus p, rho, plus eta nu rho, p minus q mu, plus eta rho mu, q minus k nu. So that's, now, it's not as bad as it looks. This, of course, will be multiplying um, into gamma matrices, and so you're going to get a trace of gamma matrices. So this is not as bad as, as it looks. And then there's the, uh, the next vertex, which is the four gluon vertex. And so, you're, so for A mu, B nu, C rho, D sigma, this is, and again I'm just taking this from the test controller, this is F A D E F C D E. And these these are these things here. And then this gets multiplied by eta mu rho. This is in the in the book, by the way, and also in the online notes. And this is a flat space-time metric, and it's Peskin metric. Although it may not make any difference. And just to repeat myself, it doesn't matter whether these guys are wrong. Okay, so it's, you can see, um, you can see why people went to the trouble of writing computer programs to work some of these things out. Um, um, and these are the diagrams that occur in the lowest Let me tell you a way that I like to look at non-being gauge. I, I give you the standard picture, okay? So now I'm going to give you the non-standard picture. And um, so that's the dark blackboard. So let me go on over here.
All right, so we started, actually maybe I should go over here, because we started out by saying that the field was a vector of matter fields. Okay, so Implicitly using a basis. In other words, for example, if you write 1, 2, minus 3, that only means something if you know what it means, what the 1 here is. And in fact, this thing would be typically x hat plus 2 y hat minus 3 z hat. Now you've got something that's basis independent. All right, so the idea is, is that we write the field psi of x as the sum i equals 1 to n, e i of x, these are basis vectors, psi i of x. And I'm going to drop the sum in a minute. Okay, now let's see what happens to uh, psi bar i, say, d slash psi. I'll leave out the m term because it's not particularly interesting. Or what the heck, why don't I do the M term first? Then we'd have psi bar psi with an M. So this would be M psi I bar EI dagger EJ psi J. And I'm going to take these EI dagger EJ to be delta I J. So this thing is just M psi I, psi I, which is, which is, or it's what, what you have in the standard case. Now, psi bar I d slash psi, on the other hand is psi bar I e I dagger I gamma mu d mu e j psi j. Now, um, the E i's, um, are vectors, and, um, uh, they don't have anything to do with the gamma matrices, so they just go right through. So this is actually psi bar i, i gamma mu, E i dagger d mu e j psi j. Now, when the derivative acts on psi j, what we get is psi bar uh, sub, well, this is too bad that I use the index i for this and then i for square root of minus 1, but there it is. E i dagger e j is then delta i j d mu psi j, and then the next term is e i d mu dagger e mu d mu e j times psi j. And so we get, we get that this is equal to psi bar i d slash psi with the identification that um, a mu i j is just, um, and this is the mathematical one, e i dagger d mu e j. So that's, that's the way I look at it. Um, Um, you can go, I can tell you some of the things that happen when you do this, um, namely, these vectors, 
EI um, suppose for example you consider a surface and um, that these two vectors suppose are just two E's and then uh, they can define a plane Now, if these vectors themselves are just two vectors, then all you have is this flat plane. On the other hand, if these vectors are, have three components or four components, or more than that, then in fact, they can move, and they can point in different directions. Okay. In other words, when the surface if this surface goes down, then these guys might be like that. But now they're effectively perpendicular to the original ones, but they're still the same two, but at a different space-time point. So we're talking about the dependence on the space-time point there, right? Well, that's the funny part of this. That's the, the part of this that always can, frankly, is still unsettled in my mind. Okay. It's that this space in which they're moving is an internal space. It's some, um, if, if there are n of these, there are n EIs that are each an n greater than n vector. So they are vectors in an internal space of higher dimension than the number of the vectors. Otherwise, if there is trivial and there's nothing but gauge transformations, there's no E and B are always zero. What's big N here? Some number bigger than little n. Good question here. So we're attaching some vector space of dimension, what, big N or little n? at each space-time point? Begin. Okay. But the vectors, the field psi is restricted to this n-dimensional space. And um, the simplest way of thinking about it is that, um, that the that little n is 2, so there's a sub surface somewhere. And it could be, it could be a surface in a three-dimensional space. In which case these vectors are, you can visualize everything. But but this three-dimensional space is the internal space. And which way the surface is, though, varies with four-dimensional space-time. That is to say, a plane, the plane, what, what, what's the tangent plane of the, to the surface at each space-time point can be different. And when it is, then you have uh, E and B non zero. So is this what motivates talking about the gauge field as a connection in the field strength of the curvature? Yeah. And so it's a connection and a curvature on which space? The space time? But the, the trouble is that it's mixed, okay? Right, because you've got this GR, GR in GR everything is space time. You've got this here. Here, you if, if, for, for this illustrative case, you've got the plane to which the to which the matter fields are confined, that plane uh, can be different at different points in space time. And let, let's just think about that plane for a second. If you have the two vectors, the two EIs that are orthogonal, you can make a transformation where you just do that to the EIs at a particular point. That's just a gauge transformation. 
at that point. But when you change the surface, that's, um, that's physical. So, um, what's a, what I think is really appealing about this is that you start out with this action, you just replace the gauge fields in a basis independent way this way, and bingo, you get the universal action of all the you know, SU2, SU3, all the Young Mills theories. Um, what's less fun is that um, the F mu nu's are more complicated because you see the A's are already defined in terms of these E's, the derivatives, the inner products. And so the F mu nu means that you take a D nu of this, and subtract, and so forth. So it gets it gets more complicated. So you Anyway, all right, so I thought I'd just um, show you that. Um, so there are two natural things to do next. Um, one is, I think, maybe an example of a Feynman calculation, the Feynman rule calculation, and then, then have you guys um, work out uh, maybe one to go on for homework. And the other thing is, we have to go through the present has of quantizing the theory and then doing the Fadier pop up trick, which is um, we did the analog for QED, the, um, the, uh, the case for uh, non bidding cases. It's, it's, I don't think it's actually any harder. Um, Which trick was this? Remember when we first quantized the electromagnetic field of the Coulomb gauge? And then we said, okay, let's write the path integral. And um, we then had uh, a delta function of the divergence of A. And actually, I put around with another delta function, but everything came out in the wash, so it was that. And then, um, we said, well, let's um, let's introduce an extra variable a zero, just as a mathematical variable, and um, we introduced that, and that allowed us to rewrite the whole thing in a, in a effectively age invariant way, and then we wound up with an expression that was just an integral over all gauge fields, and then by doing with one way. Doing it another way, these were ratios of gauge fields. And doing it another way, we got uh, a ratio of uh, path integrals, but with um, to the gauge fixing term. And here, the gauge fixing term is non trivial. And uh, well, the other one wasn't trivial either, but this one is really non trivial. And it introduced a new type of uh, All right, so I guess that's uh, enough to turn on.